everybody. Welcome to Yellowtail Talks Tech. I'm Rob Koble. I am your host. I'm also the career success manager here at Yellowtail. And today, uh, I'm going to have my second conversation with David Baker. Uh, many of you know David uh, as the uh, one of the Linux instructors here at Yellowtail Tech. Uh, he's also a Kubernetes support engineer uh, during the day. So uh, he's a man that wears many hats. So David, thank you for taking some time to come and talk to us again. Um, I know you're a busy guy, so... Uh, Hopefully, we're not cutting into your lunch hour or anything. Oh, not at all. Not at all. Can always make time uh, for the team, but uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Well, it's, it, you know, when we were talking about doing this episode, there were probably a million different topics that we could go down. Um, the last episode that we did, we kind of focused a little bit more on just general getting into the career and everything. Um I want to talk to you today a little bit more about maintaining and progressing a career. And, you know, I think that that all starts as a student, you know, you start to develop the habits as a student that are going to help you succeed long-term in the mm -hmm. industry. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, you know, and I'm going to throw a, a, a big, wide open question here to you, but what do the most successful students do to become successful students in your eyes? Consistency. Uh, consistency and, and, and dedication. Uh, I think that's what really what really stands out. There has to be some level of Dedication, not just the dedication of uh, committing to the program, right, but the dedication of day in, day out learning, right? And then the consistency is whether you establish a time at 7 a.m., 6 a.m., a time at 7 p.m., you're consistently sticking to those schedules to be able to study, learn, or whatever you can do to practice. So, that's the consistency part is not, uh, you know, if you commit to seven days a week at a certain time, it can't just be five of those seven days, right? Whatever God, it is, yeah. it's, it's got to be consistent. And then dedication is the, you know, really putting other stuff aside so that you can stay dedicated to what it is that you've committed to. So uh, I think those are the two things that uh, that really I've seen stand out. Uh, from personal experience and what I've seen through the students that are most successful is they are dedicated and they're consistent. Yeah. Consistently dedicated. <laughs> D yeah, exactly. So yeah, I, I like you talking about dedication. Um, I I'm remembering the conversation I had with one of our students earlier and um, he talked a lot about paying your dues basically. And he told me right up, you know, right up front when he enrolled in the program that, he sat down with his wife and had a conversation with her and said, you know, almost verbatim what you just said, you know, every night from seven to nine, these are going to be my study hours. So just know up front that let's prepare for that. Let's plan for me to be out of pocket between those hours. And in the, you know, in the long term, you know, I'll be coming home from my job and, you know, that's going to be time that we have together. But in the short term, let's kind of prepare for that to happen. I thought that was really smart. Absolutely. Yeah. You you, you got to, everybody's got to be aware. I mean, if you're, you know, uh, assuming that you're with a, a partner or family, whatever the case may be, your immediate circle has to know what it is that's going on so they can respect your your dedication. You know what I mean? They can respect your consistency so uh it goes so right let's on. break let's break it down a little bit more man so you you were a student once yeah so i'm, I'm what, still learning I'm, I'm a student you, right now i'm that, a student it, every day that's that's such an awesome attitude and i i love that because you're right and i think that's one of the things that we all love about our industry everything changes so frequently but Tell me a little bit about your study habits. How did you go about it? Like if you had a two hour block every night, how did you spend those two hours? Well, uh, let's say if I go back to my, my course, when I was, when I was a student in the program, 
and it really has just gone from there until now. I mean, I really have not had a day off that I'm not doing something, trying to learn something about Linux or now more specifically in the career I'm in. But essentially it would be in the evenings, uh, not counting class days, it would be a, probably at least a three hour block that I was doing something right. Like my typical day, I like to tell people what my typical day was, because at the time I was a, uh, a district manager for a coffee shop chain in Washington, D.C. So I would take the metro at like 5 a.m. because, you know, a coffee chain often opens at six. So I'm on the metro at like 5 a.m. going into D.C. and I'd walk to the metro station. So. I'd have an audio book about Linux or I'd be listening to some YouTube lecture about Linux, whatever it is, any topic. Uh, and you can imagine an audio book that talks about commands. There's very little to put together, but just so I could hear the the lingo and hear yeah. how it's talked. Even if I didn't know what they were talking about, I would hear, you know, absolute path, relative path, command, you know, PWD, even this stuff I didn't really know yet. So I'm listening to stuff on the way in. I'm listening to stuff on the train. I go to work. Uh, let's say if I'm taking an hour lunch, instead of me taking an hour lunch, I might get a lunch, but then I'm back to, to learning something, something within the coursework. And then on the way home, I'm back to listening to something else, some sort of audio book, some sort of uh, YouTube program. And then as soon as I get home, you know, catch up with the family, and then I'm studying, right? I'm studying on my virtual machine, and I'm practicing these various commands that we've learned. And I'm pretty much doing that throughout the remainder of the evening. Maybe take an hour break to, you know, uh, interact with the family and my son. And then I'm back at it. So and so that's pretty much let's say if I get home by five o'clock minus two hours with the family or let's say two hours for class. I'm pretty much on my computer learning something on the machine until probably 11 o'clock. Right? Okay. So, so I don't know if it's three to five hours a night, but that that's consistent throughout the week and on the weekends. You can probably add that into about maybe six or seven hours, uh, you know, broken up into three hour slots. But throughout the day, Saturday and Sunday. From 9 a.m. till whatever, 9 p.m. with hour breaks in between. Just constantly studying. And that's pretty much been my routine uh, now, with the exception of, you know, maybe doing something with the family outside of the home, but that's still my consistent pattern is, is every day focusing on something and learning. Yeah. I I like that. You said taking breaks. So it's interesting that your methodology for studying is very similar to what I advise for job searching, put it on your calendar and mix it up a little bit. You know, I like to say if you spend two hours in the morning, sourcing new opportunities, then take a break. Always take a break. Walk away from it. Refresh your head a little bit. You know, smoke them if you got them. Whatever. But then, when you come back, now maybe instead of doing that same thing, you mix it up. Maybe now you spend two hours doing some networking, making some calls, uh, following up on previous applications, and then you take another break. Man, you got to get away from it. You know, come back. And maybe work on a project, keep your technical skills sharp. But it's it, it's it's like you said, consistency but structure too. Because otherwise, I, f- I feel like you just get burned out, man, if you're just doing the same thing over and over all day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to, relative to what you're learning, right? There's so many different, there's so many parts to a topic. So, you know, when you're picking a certain topic, then you kind of stick with that one. Um, you know, an example. Uh, at, at my job, uh, there's a lot of networking and there's a lot of uh, utilization of IP tables, right? IP tables is essentially uh, what we can use to interact with the kernel to manage like actual packets that come in and out of the system. So long story short, it's a it's a pretty, you know, technical piece, right? So I like I might sit down for the weekend and I'm just strictly focused on IP tables. Like that's, that's my whole deep dive is what is it? How does it work? How can I get better at it? How can I read it? How can I interpret it? And I might spend the weekend on that, or even let's say the next four days of my studying is strictly on IP tables. So I have a much stronger grasp. I'm going to interact with it anyway, but in terms of what I do on my 
personal learning, it's just IP tables for that point. And then maybe yeah. I'll move into some other aspect. But to but again, like you, I think I kind of might have got off track, but to stay focused on one thing and let that be your driving factor instead of, let's say, first two hours I'll do some IP tables, my next two hours I'll do the ABC, and then for another hour I'll do DEF. So instead of just kind of touching a little bit of everything and not really absorbing anything, do the deep dive. Do the deep dive on something. Yeah. Uh, more than just a day, too. You know, it might even be a whole week on the deep dive. You know, on How do you pick topic. those topics? Like you just mentioned IP tables. I'm sure you just kind of pulled that out. But what, you know, what, what throughout your day helps you decide on what it is that you're going to work on? Uh, well, as my role as a support engineer is uh, essentially companies are paying for Rancher. Uh, Rancher is part of a... a a broader company called SUSE, S-U-S-E. Uh, so SUSE, SUSE acquired Rancher a couple of years ago. Uh, so essentially, companies have purchased Rancher support because they use Rancher to manage all of their Kubernetes. So when something breaks, when something doesn't work, they've got a problem, there's a major outage, they're calling for the support team, and I'm part of that support team, right? It's a global team literally around the globe, uh, which works out well because I never have to work in the evening because by that time, it's somebody else's morning. But anyway... Uh, as I, as I'm solving problems, there may be something I'm not quite sure about. So then that's something I need to deep dive on yeah. you know, in the evening or this weekend, right? Like I might know it, but I didn't know it enough to really be able to pinpoint that problem right away. Right. So, so based on my day to day, there's, I mean, there's literally probably a thousand different things or 10,000 different things that we interact with, but it's usually when I run across something that I'm not like a hundred percent on right away. That's the thing that I'm like, okay, put that on my short list of what I'm going to study next. I, I kind of keep a little notepad of, of topics uh, that I know I want to deep dive on, and then I'll just kind of choose a topic, and that'll be my deep dive for the weekend or for the week, or even that deep dive for the next two weeks, depending on uh, you know how, how technical it really is. Yeah, depending on the breadth of the topic, too. Exactly. You know? exactly. Some things probably be easier than others to really cover. So. So when you first started studying and, and started looking for that first job, was what you're doing now what you envisioned doing? What I'm doing now is what I learned that I wanted to do. And what I mean by that is, uh, and I'll, I'll tell students also, you know, your certification and your preparation and your interview prep and the internship, just get your foot in the door, right? Because that, that common phrase of you don't know what you don't know. From a student perspective, you might think like, oh, I want to get this certification and this certification, and I've heard about DevOps, and I want to do this and do that. And it's like, hey, just stick with one path. I chose to stick with Red Hat Linux and be Linux as my thing. So my first job, they hired me because of my uh, quote-unquote strong Linux background, right? I could speak about Linux confidently, and they were like, hey, we're going to be doing X, Y, Z, but we need somebody with a strong Linux foundation. So they hired me for that. Everything I did on that first job was brand new, right? Even if I was, even if I experienced it in the internship, it's much different in an enterprise environment where, you know, it's like this is the real deal. But they hired me to learn, but everything's based on Linux. So having that Linux foundation, you can't, you can't beat that, right? Because yeah. if you have the foundation, all these other technologies are built on top of it. So it's easy to learn everything on top. It's hard to teach people the base, right? So that's why they hired me. So Fast forward, I knew that uh, as I started to learn more about the cloud and how companies in that particular company actually utilized it and all the different tools to to build and manage infrastructure and the whole nine, I learned right away that containers are have taken over, right? Taken over in the sense of there's been a, a trend and we're not going to get into like, you know, history of how, you know, Linux has evolved and companies and whatnot, but containers have really taken over. And Kubernetes is the piece that manages those containers. So I'm like, that's where I want to focus on. I want to focus on containers and specifically Kubernetes. So six months in, that company was actually migrating to using Kubernetes. So that was good. Like, oh, okay, we're going to be doing that. But then I actually, a recruiter contacted me on LinkedIn. And literally a week and a half later, I got an offer <laughs> for another job that specifically works with Kubernetes. So I'm like, 
because this is what I really wanted to do was really, let's say, focus on being a subject matter expert when it comes to Kubernetes. And so this fell right in line with that. And so that's what I've been doing. I've been pretty much focusing. I mean, that's what we're doing, right? Everything is, is Kubernetes. So whether it's Rancher or whether it's just Kubernetes support, all of this stuff is what I've been is what I've been geared on. I've gotten uh, I got another Kubernetes certification about a month ago. I'm actually sitting for another Kubernetes certification next Saturday. And then there'll be one more that I'm trying to get by the end of the year. So my whole path is to be expert in the Kubernetes field. So yeah. That's what I wanted to do. And actually that, that job offer was right along those same lines. Otherwise I never would have left the other company. There was nothing yeah. wrong with that company. It was great money, fully remote, but this next one was also the same thing, a little bit more money, fully remote, but strictly just on the, the Kubernetes path. So that's cool, man. It's, uh, you know, I say it all the time. What, uh, you know, the first job that you get might not be the dream job, but it's the job that helps you get the dream job. And that certainly became true in your case. Yeah. Now, did you, when you were going through the program and when you started that first job, did you, so you didn't even have like eyeballs on Kubernetes at the, at that point, you, you were no. still kind of like trying didn't to figure really out what it was. was. And yeah, didn't really so, know what it was. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. I mean, there's the, you know, and that's, I don't like the question that people ask, and I ask it all the time in, in mock interviews, where do you see yourself two years from now? Where do you see yourself five years from now? And if you're a brand new student about to graduate and I ask you that question, I think a good answer is, I have no idea. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's exactly. like, right now, I just want to learn everything I can, and and then let's talk again in two years, and I'll probably have a, a more clearer path. Yeah. And then the more you're exposed to, you know, the more you know about like, because I remember, uh, you know, people used to ask me like, hey, so and this is during class. I mean, let's say what I mean during class is uh, prior to, you know, the first certification. It's like, what's your plan? You know, what's what other certification do you want to get? What do you want to? I'm like, you know what? I don't know. All I know is I'm getting a Red Hat certification and I'm going to know all things Red Hat system administrator. That's all I'm focused on. They're like, do you want to get the engineer certification? I'm like, I don't know. I'm focused on this right here, right? I'm focused on this one thing, and I'm let this one thing dictate my path, right? Yeah. Instead of instead of trying to outline my path on something I really have no clue about, I'm just going to focus on this one thing and let that be my strong point, right? So I can speak very confidently about this, and that paid off for me. And yeah. so once I got in the door, then it was like, oh, man, all this stuff that we did during the internship, it had a whole different, you know, viewpoint, right, from the from the inside, right? You don't know what the inside until you actually get there. So then once I got in the door, then it was like, oh, shoot, there's like a whole there's a whole world that I'd never know about. Yeah, yeah. Unless I was here. And that's just from this company's perspective. Right. I can't imagine how another company's approach may be or another company's approach. So once I got in there, it was like, ooh, okay. And it's like, oh, yeah, we are using containers. Oh, we are trying to migrate yeah. to Kubernetes. That is what I want to do, right? The, the you just walked edge. into Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, man. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I would have stayed with that company. I mean, because it was like, man, we were doing everything I wanted to do from a, uh, you know, and I don't, I don't like the term DevOps because everybody just throws it around nowadays. But every system administrator just migrates into that path uh, because, you know, after a while, I mean, you start to realize that that really is just the, the beginning point, right? You can have senior system administrators, but that's just the beginning point to all these new technologies, right? All yeah. the best people I work with have some sort of uh, Linux system admin background, right? Because it's just natural to, as you evolve, you start to gather more and more, you know, technologies and more and more expertise on top of the same fundamentals. So, Well, and I think that's, that's your, your case really proves a point as well in that, you know, you had that solid foundation, you, you know, you had a, a good solid foundation of the principles of Linux and what it meant to be a Linux system admin. Therefore, when you started that first job, even though they were giving you things that you haven't really done or touched on before, it didn't matter. It was easier to teach you those specific things that, than it would have been to teach you, 
you know, how to be, uh, how to be a good team member, how to be hungry to learn. And, and yeah. therefore, you know, I, I never want to undermine tech by any means, because obviously you got to be able to do the tech in order to get the job. But I think a lot of it has to do with the person as well. Absolutely. And for the students that are going through the program right now, um, and especially those that might be suffering from the dreaded imposter syndrome, you know, I, I cite stories like yours, you know, just make sure you know the basics and your approach was very solid. You know, how do you need, how do you eat an elephant? One bite one, at a time. One bite at a time, baby. That's yeah, it. that's it, man. So, you know, you got to just keep going and the path kind of naturally unfolds for those that are looking for it. Exactly. You know, if you're hungry for that, you, you know, if you have that passion for learning and getting out there, the path is going to come to you, man. Absolutely. There's a, uh, you know, and it's like constantly learning. There's a, there's a quote that I, and I don't know, I just say anonymous, uh, that, you know, I, I stick with, uh, and the quote goes, uh, you're in it now. So a common theme through your career will be learn something new or find a new career. If you mm-hmm. don't like learning new things out of curiosity, regardless of your job description, you'll have a bad time. And, and that's the truth. If, if you don't really enjoy learning, then you're not going to enjoy IT, right? Because everybody has this whole, and I hate the term IT because it's so broad and be like, oh, I'm, yeah. IT. I'm in IT, right? Because when you actually get in, you know, IT is usually the people that are, that are maintaining the, the workstations, right? If my, if my laptop goes down, I contact the IT department, right? And they're the ones that have sent me a new laptop, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I just hate the term IT because it's, it's so general. But everybody I've worked with that's successful, they're constantly learning, right? And if you're not staying ahead of the game, then you'll get left behind real quick. So, yeah, you know, and you can't just, you know, you can't make yourself like to learn. You either do or you don't. Yeah, right. You know, if you don't like to learn, you are going to find out that this is not what it's all cracked up to be. Yeah. If you don't <laughs> like to learn, then you've probably picked the wrong, wrong profession. Yeah, but so, you, don't I mean, really, you, you but, won't even see you know, that until you actually get there. I mean, it's yeah, and serious. we've talked about this before. You know, yeah. you're you're a full time student for the rest of your life. But again, that's what makes it so exciting for people. Uh, yeah. For me, I, I, I get bored easily. I've been diagnosed with the itchy brain. You know, I got to keep itching it. I got to keep scratching that. You know, finding something new, um, and, and that's what keeps me going. Uh, I, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about Linux just through osmosis. You know, being a part of Yellowtail, it's really cool and yeah. and it interests me a lot. So um now here, this is something that I'm always really interested in. Um, you know, and I and I think of uh, from my point of view, you know, I'm a big music fan and I keep up with all the all the different music that's coming out and the new releases every week and stuff like that. How do you do that with tech, man? You are working two jobs. And you have this insatiable appetite for knowledge, and yet every day something new is dropping out there. How do you keep up with it all? Uh, well, first off, all of my focus really is on Kubernetes, right? So within the Kubernetes space, uh, that's kind of where I'm, I'm getting all of that uh, staying so that, on top that, of the game. That limits it a little bit. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it keeps it, yeah. it keeps it narrowed down. So yeah, and because Kubernetes, they call it Kubernetes magic because it's so it's so uh, it's so broad, it's so vast, and it. I mean, Kubernetes to to put it into perspective, Kubernetes has a new release basically every three months, right? So in the Kubernetes world, if you're not constantly upgrading and learning what's new and what's being added, you're going to fall behind, right? In the Kubernetes world. 18 months is like 10 years behind (laughs) because literally every three months there's a new version, right? So that in itself, learning and keeping up with with, with what's new and how that changes the existing is you're you're constantly learning. And then from a a company standpoint, uh, the companies that I work with, you know, they're trying to stay ahead. So everybody is constantly learning. So I, I get enough when it comes to, because when I say Kubernetes, it literally encompasses everything. It encompasses applications, it encompasses application security, it encompasses networking, it encompasses any sort of new technology because 
some way, shape, or form, it's probably going to be tied into some sort of container. It's going to be tied into some sort of container management, which is Kubernetes. So uh, as long as I'm constantly learning Kubernetes, I indirectly stay up to speed because it's a, it's a very quickly moving technology. Uh, every three months, there's a new release. It's, yeah, you got to stay on top. Yeah, that... Uh... And I'm sure that there's uh, some releases, not a lot of change and some drastic changes, just like a software upgrade on your phone. Yeah. And then the, the thing in the, in, you know, in the enterprise world, a small change is a huge change. You know, like all it takes is one one change within a particular application. And now everything has to be reconfigured. Right. That's mm. one of the things that I deal with now with when uh, customers upgrade from one particular version to the next version, even though it's a minor or a patch release, not a minor release, but a patch release, uh, meaning let's say if you've got 1.2, 1.20, right? The zero would be the patch. And going from 1.20 to 1.21 is not a huge change, but that one little change could require a reconfiguration of all kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So, um it's it's ever changing, and I don't want to get on a tangent because I think I might be losing my focus. But uh, but it's constantly constantly staying on top of what's happening in the Kubernetes space. That's where my that's where my focus is when it says you know when I'm like trying to stay up to speed with what's happening. So yeah, okay, uh, cool. So because it moves so quick, I'm you know by default I'm staying ahead. Yeah, well, you you're paying attention to what's going on out there. And what sources would you recommend for our students that want to stay abreast of what's happening in the industry? Oh man, that's a, that's a tough Is one. that too broad of a question? Does it need to no, be narrowed it's, down? It's not because I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of unique to where I don't follow a particular publication. Um, I don't follow a, a specific outlet. If anything, I spend more time with different, uh, I have about three different, or maybe even four, I have to add them up, different subscriptions, right, that I use to to stay on top of things, right? I use this, uh, I mean, you've heard of things like Cloud Guru, maybe, or uh, Code Cloud, or O'Reilly has a subscription. I've got subscriptions to all of those things. So they constantly have new releases of different books and publications to where, relative to Kubernetes, I'll... I'll kind of add that into my, my study pattern. I haven't been one to, to really follow up on articles on a regular basis, except for when I'm researching a topic and I'll read the article, right? Like there may be an article within medium or there may be an article within some sort of tech blog, but I don't usually follow that blog because it's just too much stuff that I'm not concerned about, (laughs) you know? Yeah. So, uh, if it's a specific like Kubernetes blog, maybe, but then again, I'm still not, I don't have enough time to to focus on that one blog and see what they're talking about. I'll see if it's part of what I'm studying. Uh, gotcha. But, but that's just me. Uh, you know, I'm not big on a lot of the uh, the blogs and articles unless I run across them throughout my research. I don't really have like a, a consistent source. I used to try to I set up alerts with Google alerts to where I used to get alerts for Kubernetes. And then I tried to read those articles and they would be good. But then I'm like, eh, I'll, let me, I'll read this when I come across it when I'm in, when it's in my, my yeah. study pattern. So yeah, that's, that's just myself. You're, uh, yeah, you're, you're moving so fast, you know, doing uh, and focusing in like pinpoint focus on that one topic or whatever. I can see, you know, all that other stuff almost becomes fluff at the time. So, um, yeah, I, yeah. I think it's, I think it's important for students to, stay abreast of what's going on out there. And and if for no other reason, when you're out there networking or you're out there interviewing, to have a, a good sense of what's happening in your industry, if that stuff comes up and you're able to talk about it or at least show knowledge of it, that's really important. Yeah. And it's and it's almost like I say indirectly, right? Let's say let's say I'm working with a customer that is implementing and I'm just going to throw out these terms that you know you may or may not know. But a customer is trying to implement this thing called Isto, I S T I O, right? And it's it's a service mesh that they use for Kubernetes, right? All of that is like what Isto service mesh. 
Exactly. That's what I'm focusing on this weekend. Right. So and then I start to learn learning about those technologies that, OK, this is where a lot of companies are migrating to. Right. This is some of the new stuff that's out there, you know, in the in the world, in the field. Right. So so things that I encounter, like, let's say indirectly, I start learning about those. And that's why I think I like Kubernetes so much is it's not stagnant. Right. There's always something new. And as soon as you understand one thing, it's time to understand the next thing. Uh, so I could learn about the same thing with Istio by following a particular blog. Right. But it seems like I'm interacting with so many different companies that are trying to implement so many new things that I'm interacting with these new things. And then I'm following up on them kind of on my own. So I'm fortunate enough to be in a position within my job to where I am experiencing new things right so then it, it by default it forces me to learn those new things so uh i think that's why it makes it a little easier for me not to to follow a particular blog because i'm kind of follow or i'm just saying blog as a general term yeah i got you but uh but yeah it's because i'm and i'm seeing the new stuff and i got to learn the new stuff so. yeah yeah i'm sure that uh that keeps your dance card pretty full just staying on oh, yeah. top of the kubernetes and and whatnot oh yeah have uh, so now that you've been, you know, you've been in it for a while and you've kind of found your niche and everything, I'll ask you the question, you know, where do you see yourself two years from now, five years from now? Are you still kind of waiting to see which direction the wind blows or do you kind of have an idea of where you want to go? No, I'm pretty solid in, in that I'm going to be in this Kubernetes space, whether it's with the same company or another company. I uh, My goal two to five years is to double my income. I'm going to know my income with the Kubernetes uh, expertise because yeah. it's there, right? There's a, uh, and, and that could turn into even, even getting more into, let's say the software engineering side of it. Cause everything is based on some sort of code. So my goal is to, within the next two years, two to five years is really double my income within the Kubernetes space. Uh, whether it's still from a support side or whether it's from support, and actually getting into the software engineering where you're actually uh, contributing and writing the code. Uh, that's, that's my path right now is uh, yeah. and because it's such a, it's such a deep, broad topic. There's not like, I mean, I started this position January 3rd uh, and here I am in August and I'm just now feeling pretty confident. And in every call I get on, it's something new and I've never seen it before. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just when you thought you had it. Yeah, but you, you never have it. It's just, if anything, it's exciting to me that, uh, you know, because essentially every time I hop on, and I say hop on a call because that's pretty much what we're doing, right? I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with the experts within that company, right? And they've got a problem, and it's almost like, oh, yeah, I can help you. But yeah, if yeah. Anything, it's, it's really just more, you know, troubleshooting. If anything, I'll learn from the experts and their team that couldn't maybe figure out what's going on. And then now we're just troubleshooting the same issue. And then my, my expertise is within the rancher side of that equation and then the Kubernetes piece, but it's not like they're doing this and they don't know what Kubernetes is, but it's interesting. Cause then I start to learn uh, from those people that I'm trying to help. Right. Uh, so it's a, it's an exciting piece. So I'm excited to get on, you know, never that something is broken, you know, cause a company, when something breaks and they're losing money, that's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, but when we get stuff fixed, it's a good feeling to, uh, to solve problems and, and help people out. I think that's why I like to, you know, be an instructor. You know what I mean? I like helping people. I like yeah. helping and I like that feeling of having a problem, finding the resolution and then being like, we did it. High five. You know, what's next? What's the yeah. Next? Right on. Right on. Have you, I, I, I assume that there are other, uh, Kubernetes subject matter experts that are out there. Are you seeking them out at all and, you know, networking with them to yeah, yeah. kind of I learn mean, from them and gain knowledge? And I work with them. Our, our support team is about 39 people around the globe uh, from East Coast, Central Pacific to uh, APAJ, Asia Pacific. Uh, we've got people that are in New Zealand. We got people in Australia. We got people in China. Uh, people all throughout Europe. And these are some man. When I say these are some smart guys, uh, and actually we just hired two females, so there's some gals in there too. Uh, Good. But 
I'm surrounded by some very sharp uh, engineers, and not even not, not even talking about just the the software engineers that are writing the code themselves. I mean, so I'm fortunate enough to be able to interact with you know experts in the field. So I, you know, I don't have to I don't have to seek them out because I'm working with them. If anything, I just have to make sure that I'm constantly you know pinging them with questions. And um, yeah. you know, Slack is probably one of the best tools out there. You can spin up a huddle real quick and talk to somebody, right? So you have an issue, something that you can't figure out. You can ping one of these experts, and they can give you the the technical breakdown. That's like, oh man, I appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, I'm surrounded by some some pretty sharp experts when it comes to not even just software engineering, but uh, in the Kubernetes space of uh, software engineering. And yeah, so. I was found it a in, pretty good spot. I found a good when, spot, I think. When you came in, and, and maybe even to this day, did you find uh, that you were intimidated by these folks? Uh, not intimidated. If anything, you know, I mean, the whole imposter syndrome thing is real, right? You know, I mean, you still, I'm, I don't know. I can't really figure out when I did. My first six weeks, I literally was just studying. I was getting paid to just study every day and learn the Rancher product and learn Kubernetes before I even had my first, let's say, ticket or case. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's always that like, oh, man, I don't know what to do. And then your confidence, it's just like your first interview. Your first interview, when you look back on it, it was like probably the worst thing ever. You know what I mean? You bombed, <laughs> you, were, you were studying, you were, you know, making up stuff, trying to tell them what they want to hear and all kind of stuff. And then by the time you get to interview 10 and 20, you know, you almost feel like you're managing the interview. You know what I mean? Right, you, feel like, right. you feel like you're in the driver's seat. You're interviewing the interviewee, you know, or you're interviewing the interviewer. Uh, but that confidence level shifts. So it's, it's the same thing here. The more and more that, I, that I've stuck with what I'm doing, the confidence level has shifted to where every now and then there still might be that quote unquote imposter syndrome, but the confidence there wipes that out, right? So then I'm like, I can confidently say I don't know that, but I can get the answer. Well, and, and, you know, that to me is the definition of confidence, not that you know everything, but that you're confident you can find the answer. And that means that you have to ask questions and you yourself just talked about, you know, pinging your, your team and, and utilizing the expertise of the team and not being afraid to ask those questions. You know, what, what you said earlier, you know, what you know is what you know, right? So Mm -hmm. Uh, if you don't know it, own up to it and learn it, I guess, would be uh, would be the advice here. Yeah, exactly. What are you doing to to improve? Right. It's one yeah. thing to be like, I don't know something. Right. You can be like, I don't know something. And then you're like, you know, shrug your shoulders down and be like, oh, woe is me. You know, I don't know something. Oh, somebody help me. And it's like, OK, while you're looking for help, what are you doing to help yourself? Right. Because yeah. at some point. At some point, you have to get get the answer, right? Whether it takes you two months or twenty minutes, you know. What if there is nobody to help you? I mean, then what? You know, you 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 quit and walk away, and then try to go to the next job, and then you find yourself in the same predicament of not knowing something, and then, you know that's not a good pattern. So, uh, either way, you have to find the answer, right? You have to continue to do the research. Uh, I mean, and I think that's how the people that invent stuff, right? They end up trying to solve a problem and they can't find it. And then they end up finding the answer and implementing their own. Yeah. So I want to switch gears here for the last few minutes that we have in, in talk, you know, we've been talking about your day job and, uh, and everything for a while here. Let's talk about your, uh, your teaching job, you know, um, yours, uh, we have like some seriously good teachers here at Yellowtail, uh, yours was a name that came to my attention very early on. Um, I see that you're active on the Slack channels, you're, you know, posting things and, um, you have a presence out there. How, how important is that for students? Uh, it's super important because if, if you're not involved, you're not involved. I mean, simple as that. If, if you're not engaging and you're not involved, that translates into everything else. Even if you're like, I'm doing I'm doing stuff on my own, right? But if you're not engaged with those that are around you and your your cohort mates or or just anybody, right? It could be something as if you know the answer. So many people know the answer to something. They see somebody posted it, but they don't say anything. And it's like, hey, just say something, 
right? That's the whole thing. I mean, the, the whole piece with uh, the company I'm with is an open source uh, company. Rancher is an open source product, meaning as opposed to, let's say, Mac or Windows where you have to pay for it, you can get everything Rancher for free, right? You can go to a, the website in GitHub and you can see all of the code itself, right, if you want to learn it. And that whole idea of everybody pitching in is what our company is, right, is everybody's pitching in. That's what we're doing here at Yellowtail. Not only is, are the, the teachers instructing, but, you know, we're pitching in with answers and, and feedback and, hey, this is what worked for me. It'll work for you. Here's what we're seeing is happening in the world and, and what, you know, the most successful people are doing. They're doing this. But being engaged is, uh, I mean, it just comes with the territory, right? It shouldn't be, hey, engage, right? You have to be engaged because that translates into the way that you talk during an interview. It translates into how you introduce yourself to the company, right? When you come into the company, you can come into the company as someone who's engaged or someone who's fluttering off to the side who gets forgotten about. And then next thing you know, you're trying to find a new job because you feel like, you're not part of the team or something. I yeah. Don't know. But, uh, yeah. You got to stay engaged. That, I, I, I love that, man. And, and I love the, uh, the take on teamwork there, you know, I mean, obviously two things that are at the top of everybody's, I need to hire list that you never, well, I shouldn't say never, but you rarely see in the actual job post teamwork communication, you know, these things mm-hmm. are essential. And, uh, you have the opportunity as a student to really practice them, however many don't. So, um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Yep. And I think it even starts with, let's say somebody asks a question, right? Let's say there's a cohort of 30 people and one person asks a question. And let's say realistically, maybe half or less than half actually see it, uh, you know, just because the nature of how people have notifications set up or not. Even if you see something that you don't know, it even helps to say, man, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll, I'll follow the thread to see if, you know, maybe I can learn too, right? Even when somebody posts a question, because people get hesitant to post questions because they just kind of sit out there in the ether, right? And that's why I think I'm so quick to engage and try to answer a question and let people know, hey, we're looking at it, right? I see what you're doing. Let's see if we can find out, right? So yeah. I, I tell people, hey, if you don't know, even even reply in thread like, man, sorry, I don't know. Right. But they know somebody saw it. Right. Or throw an emoji on there. It, somebody knows that you looked at it. Right. So then yeah, you yeah. can be like, OK, uh, I'm getting some traction. Right. Maybe somebody sees it. You know, the it, going back to study habits, and this is something I meant to bring up a little uh, a little bit earlier, but we're kind of in that same ballpark now. Uh, I would imagine that in doing that as well, you could create a lot of home projects for yourself. You well, know, yeah. one of the, one of the things that I think is going to help keep you sharp, and maybe you could shed some light on what are some of the things people could be doing at home to practice these skills. To exactly do, I think what you just said, right? Setting up a setting up a lab, setting up a scenario, right? Let's say, for example, uh, there's one part of there's one aspect of our job where we deal with authentication and using third party authentication providers uh, like one is called open LDAP. Right. So within Rancher to have, let's say, members of your organization log in and authenticate, you can incorporate open LDAP, which is essentially like an active directory where you have a centralized place that has all of everybody's information. As long as you put them into that centralized place, then they can use their username an account to let's say log in so that whole process the best way to learn is set up your own open ldap server right find some sort of tutorial or some sort of article that walks you through how to set up an open ldap server set it up and then actually go to set up rancher and then you set up rancher using that third party auth- uh, authentication tool open ldap and then you incorporate that in right then like one thing i did was i did that and then I gave uh, my wife, I added her to the open LDAP and I'm like, hey, use this, go to this website and try to log in. Right. And they go log in. I'm like, see, I set that up. Right? <laughs> and so, like, if, if we had somebody else, I can add them to the open LDAP and then they'd be able to log into this instance and be able to do stuff. Right. So so just those kind of things. Right. Because it's one thing to be like, what's open LDAP? 
how does that work? It's another thing to actually try to get a project and do it. Right. And in the process of putting that project together, you start to learn different pieces. So now here I am on a call. Somebody's got a problem with authentication. My questions are more structured, like, hey, did you did you add this? You know, do you have a common name? Is the common name matching the other common name? Like, did we verify that it is port uh, 9345 because that's the port that that particular protocol uses? Uh, but not just because of looking at notes, but because of a project I did, I have a much better understanding yeah. of that, right? So, well, you saw the pieces in motion by doing exactly. the project and going into an interview and being able to tell somebody you did this instead of you read about this certainly makes a big difference as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I'm doing when I'm learning. I'm learning by setting up labs, right? I call it a lab where it's like, um, let's say when you talk about Kubernetes, right, you have to have various servers and applications running. So I set up those servers and I set up those, excuse me, applications. And then we break something and fix it. Meaning like, let's say we've got three servers and what happens if a server goes down? All right, well, let's set up a lab and then let's just power off that server. Let's see how everything breaks and now let's fix it. You know, and let's let's OK, here's a two. Here's a here's an article that talks about how to recover from this particular disaster. All right. Well, let's make that disaster and then let's recover from it. Uh, yeah. So, but you do that all within a lab. You can't you can't learn that by just reading the article. Right. You know, right. You have to do it. So uh, lab everything. That's what I say. Set up a lab. <laughs> you got you to gotta lab everything. Lab it out. Nice. Nice. David, we're uh, we're we're starting to get to that forty-five minute point here, and I don't want to go too much longer. I know you've probably got some work you need to do, yeah. So um, I'm going to ask you uh, just one last question, and you know, our our current students have probably heard this from you already, but I want you, in your words, to give us your best bits of advice for succeeding as a student. And developing those habits that will keep you going once you get out there. Practice every day, right? And 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 my wife always points out, like, hey, you should be more clear on what that means, right? Like a more practical approach. So I, I'll tell, I'll 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 put it this way. Let's just take you got modules one through ten, right? Each module has an assignment. So module one. Learn the material, do the assignment, and do the assignment at least three times, right? You do it once. You don't do it once and be like, high five, I'm done. Yeah. Do it, do it twice. All right, here we go. Module two. Learn module two stuff. Do the module two assignment. Do that three times. Go back and do module one again. So now you're done. You've done module two three times, and now this will be the fourth time that you've done module one assignment. Module three comes around, learn module three, do the module three assignment three times, go back and do the module two assignment again, and go back and do the module one assignment again. Keep that same pattern of doing what's current and going back and completing the stuff you've done before so that by the time you get to module eight, you've already done module one probably 20 times to the point where you're tired of doing it because it's so repetitive. But it's like muscle memory now. Exactly. When it gets to the point where you're tired of doing it because you've done it too much, that's when you might have, you may have learned it. You might have gotten it at that point. So just repetition, use the tools that are there. And when in doubt, just keep doing the same thing over and over and over a hundred thousand times until you're not even thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Muscle memory, man. It works in golf. It works in baseball. You know, any major uh, sports uh, function like that, you do it so often that your body just automatically starts doing it, you know, whether you want to or not. And um, yeah, I can see that, man. So, man, David, thank you so much once again for taking some time with us. Um, It's always good to connect with you and uh, get your thoughts, man. And and thank you for all that you do here for Yellowtail, man. It's uh, it's good to have you and your uh, your passion and your enthusiasm and your engagement, man. So I tip my hat to you, brother, and um, I hope that we can uh, 
maybe have you on again sometime. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm always on Slack, as they say. Yeah. Uh, constantly engaged. And, uh, you know, I use Slack at the job, so I'm constantly on Slack. We're always still learning. Uh, I enjoy what I do. Glad I could be on with you. Uh, anytime I can, you know, add my two cents, I'm happy to. <laughs> and uh, all right. Right on, man. Well, uh, and for those of you out there that uh, that uh, made it through to the end, uh, number one, thank you. We appreciate you coming on and, and checking out Yellowtail Talks Tech. Um, we'll be back with episode four here uh, uh, sometime within the next month. And um, as always, I'm open to any ideas or suggestions that you have on topics that you would like to hear about. Uh, as it pertains to, uh, you know, the industry, to being a student, to getting a job, uh, or as I always like to say, what records are you listening to this week? But that's just a personal thing for me. But um, I do like record recommendations. So, hint, hint. Okay. So, thanks again for tuning in, everybody. Uh, I look forward to catching up with y'all real soon. Mm-hmm.